looking at places that have the infrastructure designed to make it safe for people to bike. And it's something, you know, if you continue doing it for your whole life, why would you stop? You feel like it's just a, it's a joyful and normal part of your life. And yeah, lots of kids biking out by themselves and, and hanging out in parks by themselves. I mean, it, it, it cults, it's a sense of independence throughout their lives that I, I really, it's very sad for me that we don't, we don't have that here. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Simmerman, and that was Taylor Griggs. Uh, Taylor is a staff writer for bikeportland.org, and uh, she just got back from a month-long trip in Europe. And so we have some reflections about some of the things that she uh, learned during her trip over there, and uh, how some of those uh, things that she picked up can be applied here in North America. Uh, it is a fabulous conversation, and I look forward to sharing it with you now. Enjoy. Taylor Griggs, it is an absolute joy and honor having you on the Active Towns podcast. Welcome. Thank you very much. It's an honor and joy to be here. I very much appreciate you asking me. Absolutely. Uh, I love to have my guests just uh, give a quick little introduction of themselves. So uh, who is Taylor Griggs? Yes. So, um, yeah, I'm Taylor. I live in Portland, Oregon. I've been writing for Bike Portland for over a year now, a little bit over a year. I started last November. I am from Colorado originally, and I have kind of always been interested in urban design, but not necessarily put that name on it. I mean, I liked to bike as a kid and use public transportation. I was always very interested in it, but I didn't. I studied journalism in college. I didn't um, really take any urban development classes. It was after, and I'm going into this introduction because I, a lot of people kind of tell how they got into kind of their urbanist rabbit hole, which is sort of a part of um, their introduction. I exactly. think exactly. It's yeah, very. It's always very interesting to find out. You know what? What was it that that got people interested in this. Um, for me, I don't know exactly. It seems like one day I just sort of, I kind of was hearing about maybe on online. Um, and I was like, wow, this is like actually extremely interesting. I think I was interested in kind of finding a niche for myself as a journalist. And I realized, I guess this is something that, that people really do. And, and this is, could be something I, I could focus on. So yeah, and then it was all from there. I, I became every day I learned something new and I become, uh, yeah, more educated on it. Yeah. Well, it's interesting, too. So now what part of Colorado were you in? From the suburbs south of Denver. Okay. Um, Centennial. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. And then you went away to college uh, in Oregon? Yes, I went to the University of Oregon. Ah, okay. Right there in Eugene? Mm -hmm. Ah, okay, cool. Well, and that's yeah. a, it's a pretty interesting place. Eugene, uh, there's a fair amount of active mobility there in Eugene. Oh, yeah. They're, they're working hard to try to build out uh, their, their bike network there. Like most university towns like Boulder with the, with CU, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's a, a fair amount of energy and youth and, and, uh, there, there is that sort of inclination towards uh, a lot of walking and biking. Yes, for sure. I biked a lot in Eugene. It was really important to me to have a bike when I was there. And it wasn't something I thought about very much, though. I mean, it was just kind of what, what I did. And I really didn't know any names for any, anything um, related to, you know, bike infrastructure or anything like that. But at a certain point, I was working for a local newspaper there and kind of covering government meetings. And there was a week where there wasn't much going on and I was kind of looking around for something to cover and there was like the local active transportation meeting and I sat in on that and it was I think the first time that anybody had covered their active transportation meeting of like 10 people for this little town. I found it extremely interesting and I tried to convey that to other people in the best way I could. And now that's kind of what I do all the time. So, yeah. And that's what you do all the time. That's, that's pretty funny. And, uh, you actually kind of hit my radar screen 
A, because I, I, I subscribe to, to bikeportland.org and, and, and support the work that you all have been doing there in the Portland area. I try to make it to Portland as often as I can. Um, for a while there, I was there on the ground uh, every summer to uh, film some of the uh, Sunday events, the Sunday Parkway events, mm -hmm. the, the Open Streets events, especially in the uh, far northeast corridor uh in the gateway district um uh, that okay, particular yeah. area out there is what i like to call the most unportland of portland neighborhoods <laughs> because it's it's basically yeah. you know one of those far reaching suburbs and so i've been documenting over the years sort of the 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 halsey uh you know corridor and they're trying to build out the 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 uh, protected bikeways out there. And, mm -hmm. uh, so anyways, um, I always keep an eye on what, what Portland is, is doing and, what, and, and what's happening. And this particular article hit my radar screen and I was like, Ooh, I got to talk with Taylor because <laughs> you were talking about, um, you know, advisory bike lanes and, or, or as they're also known, uh, edge lane roads. And uh, I had done an entire episode with Michael Williams, who also lives there in the Portland area and is a subject matter expert worldwide in advisory bike lanes and edge lane roads. And so I was uh, super, super stoked to see that you were writing about uh, advisory bike lanes slash edge lane roads. And that's how you and I got connected. I reached out and said, hey, yeah. <laughs> I know you're over well, there. I appreciate it. Because literally you were <laughs> over there at the time, right? I think this was the first article that I wrote in yeah. Yeah. Europe, really. Well, yeah. I thought I knew something before I started, but now looking at it, it's like, wow, I really had no idea. Because I, and it, it does take the kind of work that you you need to be doing it on a, a daily basis, combing through these kind of government documents. People don't have the time to to do this. It's very it like it's a time consuming thing. Um, and I didn't necessarily. Yeah, every time I write an article, I don't think, OK, I'm going to learn this, this and this. But over, it just kind of happens that way. You're just you. It's like, what what is this? I mean, learning about I don't know, like um, yeah. different freight plans or. Uh, just, I can't think of, I guess, really specific examples right now, but yeah. just, yeah, I learned a lot and definitely it just kind of through osmosis and yeah, over yeah. time, well, but, what's, um, for sure. What's very neat different. about this, yeah, what's neat about this process too, is like, you're able to start to put word, you know, words to things that you're seeing and experiencing and and also words to to feelings and you know the thing that i i see that is right there people feel comfortable enough using the streets and and that's when it really gets past the wonkiness and and using all the this terminology and gets down to the level of readers and your community members is because what matters most is you know that side of the narrative that side of the storytelling of feelings how does it oh, feel yeah 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 and yes, so that's, and I that's love what's talking great. to people and yeah for sure so in um this advisory bike lane story i was very interested in because we as i said in the article i had just seen some that they recently put in portland kind of near where you're talking about out in east portland so a part of the city that has I mean, yeah, like you said, in kind of the most un-Portland-y area. So it was surprising to me upon first seeing these when I before I had gone to the Netherlands that this is the place they decided to put them because I was, I'm a little skeptical that the people who drive out there who aren't used to much bike infrastructure at all will um, kind of know what to do with these. And then going to Utrecht, which is a place where they have just ingrained into the city that cyclists are, are to be respected and, and, you know, people who drive cars are really not prioritized in their planning, which is, it was so crazy and unfamiliar to, to see that. And, um, and it made me doubt that these kind of advisory bike lanes can work well in the places that the planning isn't really going out of its way to prioritize cyclists. Like there's a cultural element that I fear will will make these um less useful in places like 
Portland and, and throughout the U.S. than in the Netherlands. You just recently got back uh, the beginning mm-hmm. of this month. Why don't you just take a moment to reflect upon what it was like? Yes, for sure. So for context, I, I traveled to Europe. I just was in, um, I went to Amsterdam, Utrecht, Copenhagen, Brussels, Paris, and Bilbao and Barcelona in Spain. And I went because my sister is teaching English right now in Bilbao. So that was kind of the impetus for going a visit to her. And, you know, I don't want go there very often. So I was kind of turning this into a bigger trip. And obviously, as I've been, you know, immersed in urbanism and bike infrastructure over the past year or so, I've heard a lot about these places. And um, it's everybody, it's kind of a, a ritual, I guess, for people to take these, these trips and find out what's going on in places overseas. And I'd been, I've been to Europe before this, but I was not as aware paying, you know, as much attention to, to, I didn't have names for things like I do now. So I was excited to go in with a different perspective. So I guess what I learned, I mean, I learned a lot. It was, it was very interesting. I think that there's kind of that struggle between the cultural aspects and the design and what can be implemented in the U.S. and what can't. I think that we could certainly be doing a lot more. And we, I, I actually appreciate I didn't mean to come off very, uh, you know, critical towards the city for putting in these advisory bike lanes because I appreciate doing that kind of experimentation, especially when it's following like these progressive bike cities in Europe. I just, I think there is such a difference here that it makes it more important to have drastic design that like forces people driving to respect people who aren't in cars in a way that they, yeah, uh, as it's designed now, that's just not what is natural to do. Yeah. So. And the reason I I fast forwarded to this uh, particular area is, is this was one of your last learnings that you, you highlighted here. And you said, try try your best to stay away from mythologizing. And, uh, and there's your sister (laughs) and you guys are uh, (laughs) there, there in Brussels. And, uh, and, and I think Brussels is a great example of uh, a European city that's struggling, that's striving to try to get better, but similar to Portland, similar to many of the cities in North America, there's still a long way to go. It was very interesting to see that one of the very first points that you highlighted in this article was talking about grade separation and that design ethic of, of how important that was or how important that made you feel while you were on the ground there. Yeah. And I think I said in here that it, it, there's some element of it that's like perceived safety um, yes. because, you know, a few inches of grade separation, it yeah. isn't that much. And, and somebody still could, you know, drive up on there, but just the fact that, yeah, I, I felt like I was distinct here and that was, that was helpful, I think, for, for feeling, yes, safe in the, in Copenhagen where they really implement grade separation. And I, I really liked it. We don't have a lot of that here. So you made the point too, that the grade separation also applies to the differentiation um, between the, uh, the cycle lane and the pedestrian realm too. So there, there is that stepped grade separation between each of the, uh, the modes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Plus there's like, and the, the sidewalks are often made of cobblestone or something right. a lot rougher that you can walk on and, and not bike on. So it, it creates even more of that separation, which in a place like Copenhagen, there's just not that kind of conflict between people walking and biking that there is in Amsterdam, which I think I said in another article about this there, they're definitely is when there's so many people biking, I mean, I don't know, there's some amount of, of conflict there between all the the people walking too, but I think it's, it's okay. I mean, obviously people on bikes are a lot less likely to cause major harm than if you're driving a car. Yeah. Yeah. And I love this too, is because this goes back to design. Sometimes it's the little things, those little touches that make so much of a difference. 
Yeah, I mean, these are in some way when I, I can get around without them. It's I'm biking around Portland. I'm thinking, do I really need this? But it kind of shows a respect for the transportation mode that is like giving little accommodations just to make people feel comfortable. And it, it's not that big of a deal. It's not that. Yeah, but it it would really show something. I mean, yeah, these allow you to kind of lean on something when you're waiting. You don't have to totally dismount. Yeah. You know, the very first time I ever saw one of those in the wild hmm. was, was, it was in the Pacific Northwest. It was up in Seattle. They had just, yeah, installed they do one have some up there. Yeah. That's yeah. cool. I should, yeah. I would like to check it out at some point. Yeah. And I wonder if people use them to the same degree there. They seem to be pretty well, well used. Yeah. The one that I'm thinking of, uh, was on a very, very busy, uh, uh, bike corridor area right in front of a Starbucks there. And it's just, you know, it was, it was a wonderful uh, location to do it. And, and it, it, it was such a high profile area that, it, you know, other people see other people using it. It's like, oh yeah, this is a nice little convenience. Mm-hmm. And, and it's those little things that just make all the difference. Yeah, for sure. So, yeah. Any, any other thoughts that, uh, you know, now that you, you know, or even a, a couple of weeks out from having, been there that uh, are, are, you know, sort of popping into your head and just really resonating about the trip? Well, I've realized that when I, since I've been back and biking around Portland, which before I felt very, very comfortable doing and, and used to it. And I, some of it is just for a while, I kind of, I hurt my hand and I wasn't biking very much for a couple of weeks. So it's just kind of getting back into it at all. I don't think I like I was only in Europe for a month and I don't think I really totally, you know, acclimated or or anything like that. But coming back, I've realized I feel kind of some amount of social anxiety about shared roads with car drivers that I didn't really, I'd been able to get over before. And I think that the fact that people will yell at you or just I feel some internal pressure to to be going fast and, and kind of keeping things moving quickly. And I think that that's particularly, it could be a problem for women who feel like they need to be accommodating all the time, just socialized to do that. So something I've noticed in in Europe, that's just not an issue. Like you always have a place to go. I mean, if you're biking, you're not going to have to worry about what the people driving behind you are thinking because they have their space and you have yours. And there's just a, a culture and a design that you feel like you have the right to be there kind of. And I, it made me think of this TikTok or, or something I'd seen at some point that mentioned like it's embarrassing to walk in a city that's not like very pedestrian friendly. And it was sort of funny to think of it's like uh, embarrassing to walk around in an area without crosswalks or something. But it does, it feels like you're you're doing something out of the ordinary that you're, you're drawing a lot of attention to yourself and it's just, you're kind of disrupting the way of, um, that everybody, what else everybody else is doing. And it, I think that people of all, like who might feel more uncomfortable doing something like that, just, it's a lot easier to do when there's places dedicated for you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting too, because when we, when we think of, the like especially the the dutch network when we look at the dutch network cycle network only about 30 percent of the dutch cycle network is actually protected or separated space 70 percent of the entire network is actually some form of shared space whether it's like like an edge lane road or a feet strut but then it gets to the other thing that we were uh, talking about is that there is that reality, though, that not only are the drivers driving more cautiously, but in that scenario, in that situation, they are also more likely than not to be on a bike in just a matter of minutes or hours because they're much more likely to, to also bike, which is is kind of the flip of what we have you know, in North America, where it's very unlikely that the driver of the motor vehicle is going to be, you know, riding a bike in, in the matter of a few minutes. Oh yeah, totally. Yes. So 
Definitely. And so the, the shared streets that we have here in Portland, the neighborhood greenways, which I think could be a great idea and, and really are in some areas where there are traffic calming measures really put in, they're just still normal. I mean, there's always that sense, okay, I might, this person is driving really close behind me right now, like feeling kind of apologetic for taking up space on this street that you have every right to be there when you're biking. I mean, you do on every street, really. And, and I'm not, um, theoretically, I really disagree with what I'm saying about the way that I feel sometimes. But in practice, I, I get nervous about it. And, and it's come back stronger since I've gotten back, which I'm hoping to overcome again. But well, one of the interesting things, too, is that it was pointed out to me by uh, some of my Dutch friends. In fact, uh, Mark Wagenberg, uh, Bicycle Dutch, uh, you know, pointed out that there's a cultural ethic, too, of just being comfortable with being close, very close to other people. And so when they're when they're riding their bikes, you know, they're very comfortable with being very, very close to each other. They're very comfortable being very close to motor vehicles and mo having motor vehicles be very close to them. They're just like, yeah, no, we're used to this. And I'm like, oh, wow. Yeah. They don't, they don't get upset about, oh, that car got too close to me. It's like, yeah, no, it's, we're all, we're used to being close to each other. So. Yeah. It would be fine if I didn't feel like they're trying to push me off the, the road in some True. way. Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah, just the, but yeah. it's, it seems like people are impatient and maybe not all the time. And I, I, I attribute that wrongly to some people yeah. um, and I'm hyper vigilant about it or something, but uh, there's definitely just that, that difference here. And I think, yeah, you're right. It's the fact that a lot of people just are, don't know what it's like, I guess, to get around by bike. Now, you and I both had the opportunity to, to go and visit Paris. And you had a little bit of a rough go with Paris. And, 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 and you mentioned your hand. So why don't you go ahead and, and share the story? Yeah, so I... <laughs> was on like in the first five minutes of biking in Paris, which I was very excited to do because there's been a lot said about its transformation over the past few years as a very bikeable city. And this was a in a parking protected bike lane. There was just a big kind of bump in the in the lane there that I yeah hear. And I was on a a bike, a Dutch style bike with the pedal brakes. And I kind of forgot that I had that because I'm not used to riding a bike like that. And so I like kind of was flustered. I didn't know how to stop. And I leaned over on that car to the left there. And like, yeah, I broke the back light with my hand and shattered the glass and really cut up my hand. Um, and Oops. then had some experiences in the French hospital. Yes, I did talk to the guy whose car that was, by the way. Um, and everything's fine with that. So, so yeah, so it was a little bit of a rough start, a rough go, uh, with Paris. And in the article, you also, uh, sort of mentioned the fact that you, you felt a little compelled to go there because so many people were talking about it. The whole reason why I went out of my way during my three week uh, trip, European trip this uh, past fall to, to make it to, to Paris was the same thing. I kept hearing about all the transformations. My last trip there was in uh, 2015. And so I was like, okay, I got to go there. I, I need to, I need to document some of this. And so, uh, so that was part of the reason why you, you felt compelled to, to make it back over there and, and to check it out. Uh, other than being the hand, <laughs> the rough go with the, uh, the injury to the hand, um, what, what were your, what were your observations and thoughts uh, over your previous trip? Well, uh, yeah, it's hard to compare my previous trip because at the time I just was not looking out for the same things that I I am now. So I ultimately was, I think this experience was positive, as I kind of said. I think, I mean, it was interesting to experience the French healthcare system like I did. The people were, I didn't experience like any victim blaming for in which it, it really I kind of messed up when I was biking here so it was you know there was some in infrastructure issues but it wasn't really anybody's fault but everyone was very kind or at least they 
I thought they were because they were speaking French and I didn't understand. But yeah, I think that I, whenever a city or gets really heralded as being kind of the new mecca of something and, and it's hyped up in a way because that's what gets headlines and that's what is attractive to say is like this is you know it's totally transformed I wasn't disappointed by it I wouldn't use that term it wasn't it just has some way to go before it can be a Dutch or, or Danish city but I do I think they're doing a good job of of putting in short-term implementations and just in doing their best to make things happen quickly instead of waiting around forever for it to be perfect. And I would prefer that then we don't have to have everything perfect. Of course, it would be nice to have these bumps fixed in the streets so this doesn't happen. But, you know, it's better, in my opinion, to to do what you can as soon as possible. And, and over time, it'll it'll improve. Yeah. I'm lingering on this shot because this is one of the things that reminds me of my uh, my trip to Paris in 2015 because I went out of my way to be there for their very first car free day. And so I got to experience Paris um, the very first time they just opened up all of these streets to people to walk and bike and rollerblade and skateboard and I think that this is incredibly important because it helps to teach and reframe what streets are for. Uh, it helps the, the community see that, hey, our streets can be for something other than just, you know, two ton monstrosities on wheels, you know, <laughs> rumbling down uh, the Champs-Élysées. It, it can be yeah. something more than that. And I think that's, cities in the u.s also do yeah can do that like you're talking about with the sunday parkways here in portland earlier which is something where they close off streets largely to to car traffic for a day and have people biking and walking around i think that can transform what people it can sort of yeah change your perspective and it's like wow this was really nice like how can we make this happen more often or how can there be more places like this we don't have to just wait for the summer, you know, a couple times every year and we could have this happening more. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the other things that, that I think really helps to reframe what our streets are for is starting to occupy that streetscape strategically and intentionally. And that's exactly what this, this bunch of photos is here. Talk a little bit about what we're seeing here. Okay, so this is, yeah, th- this was at the very end of the trip. I had this planned and I was very excited for it. This is the Barcelona bike bus, BC bus, one of them. Um, this is one that goes every single day. Um, and yeah, I love this. I it took this like really small kid here. I think he was like three or four um, who, oh, it was just so great to see. I mean, this was a, the bike bus. Okay, let me. I guess, start over, has become very popular recently in part because of somebody, Sam Balto in Portland, who has gone really viral on TikTok for his videos of the bike buses here. Um, And he leads one every week in a very particularly walkable and bikeable part of the city. And there are some kind of cropping up in other parts but there's none that happen on a daily basis like it does here so even though they're so smaller than we see in portland on every every wednesday at this particular school they do it every day and this is like an act what they were saying afterwards when i talked to some of the parents who lead it is they think of this as like a a critical mass kind of protest on a daily basis to like yeah reframe what these streets can be used for and when you see kids like this in the street. And this is something that, yeah, I really feel like this could be hugely transformative, this bike bus revolution. It just, it makes people think twice before making some kind of comment about, you know, these people shouldn't be in the streets like they might for, for another group of cyclists. People think it's, it's great to see it. And then they think, okay, well, how could we make this happen? 
in our city. And people have started to do that, which I think is so great to see. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. And uh, Sam Balto was featured here on the podcast, uh, both in the video and also the audio only versions. And we've also had Megan Ramey, who is also uh, very much involved in these types of activities up in uh, Hood River, uh, Oregon. So um, it was wonderful to have both Sam and Megan uh, featured here on the podcast. And you're absolutely right. It helps to reframe what is considered normal out in our public realm, out on our streets. And it's it's also just kind of reframing, too, when we think about our streets and what streets are for, you know, this is this is all about, you know, who is welcome in these spaces. And it's really about all ages and all abilities. And that's such an important thing, I think, um, to take away from, you know, any of our travels. And it, I get the sense that you really felt that, you know, from your European trip is that you really saw that all ages and abilities sort of welcoming environment. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, it was just, it really took away any notion that that cycling or, or walking and using active transportation is, is only for a certain subset of people, which is an argument that a lot of people in the U.S. use, like, okay, well, as soon as you hit 60 or something, you're done for, you can't bike anymore. That's very obviously not true when you're looking at places that have the infrastructure designed to make it safe for people to bike. And it's something, you know, if you continue doing it for your whole life, why would you stop? You feel like it's just a, it's a joyful and normal part of your life. And yeah, lots of kids biking out by themselves and, and hanging out in parks by themselves. I mean, it, it, it cultiv- it's a sense of independence throughout their lives that I, I really, it's very sad for me that we don't, we don't have that here. And yeah, I just, people look like they're having a great time all the time and they have so many spaces that they can enjoy. It feels, yeah, a little bit envious of these, these kids that they have this. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I just, I, I love this shot right here because this to me really exemplifies what we should be striving for in you know cities around the globe. You should feel as if you are able to create an environment where girls that are between the ages of, you know, 10 and 16 just feel completely welcome being able to explore the environment on the bike, be able to have that sense of freedom. And I just, I I think it's so incredibly powerful because we do see a huge drop off in rates of girls riding um, once they start getting into their teen years, because even in environments where we have uh, a large number of kids riding to school in elementary school, once they started getting into into middle school, that those numbers start to drop off a little bit. And once they get into high school, they just plummet. And they really drop off, but where we don't really see that drop off. And in fact, we see uh, almost an uptick because many times their schools are close enough where they walk to school (laughs) in the earlier uh, grades. And then it's not until the the middle school and then into the the secondary school, the primary or the, the high school level where their distances are longer. And so their numbers actually go up. So this is this is really, really special to me to see, you know, girls, especially girls riding at at 10 uh, on up into their into their teenage years. Yeah, I know. And this the girl in the back there, she's just uh, looking relaxed and letting her friend kind of ride her around. This is something that if people were doing this here, I mean, there'd be a lot of angry and scared responses or like, how could you let your kids do something like that? But they're totally fine. I mean, they're just not really at at risk here. There's people are paying attention to them. They do this all the time. They know what they're doing better than we do. I mean, I, I, yeah, I know there'd be some pushback at first, but I, I really feel like this is important to, to get over here. Yeah. 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 It's good stuff. The other thing that I really noticed when I was over in, in Europe this, this past trip was really the, the transformation of public space. What were some of the things that you noticed when you were over there? 
Yeah, for sure. So much of what people love about Europe, people who don't have necessarily the terminology to describe it, is the fact, like I didn't before when I went there, is that you can just, there's so many plazas, there's places to sit. I mean, everybody talks about how in Paris, you know, people are sitting out on the streets on cafes, just like drinking coffee all day long. And part of that is, you know, it's part of their culture, but also part of it is they have this public space to, to do that in and they're building more. And so this was another example. I have an article about this here in Portland. There's been some talk about transforming car parking spaces on the street into tree planting zones. And in Amsterdam, they've been doing that a lot in, especially in one particular neighborhood. I thought, okay, some tree zones, some bike parking, there's a lot of that. And then I came upon this area where there's this new play structure like it just in it, where a car used to be parked it was so crazy to see this because this was like wow I mean I just can't believe it's awesome that they would would do that and it's yeah so they have not in addition to this green space they've also put in yeah a play structure and it just gives kids an, just another place to enjoy them I mean all of Europe I was like taking pictures of all these playgrounds I saw because there's just everywhere. And it was, yeah, just so many opportunities for kids to, to explore and play within their cities. Well, big kids and little kids. Yeah, for sure. Like this year and, and in Copenhagen, there's, I think at this park, there's, yeah, also a lot of people roller skating around and this just looks so cool. And yeah, you'd see, parents out with their kids sometimes or sometimes sitting there kind of not paying that much attention to them because it's a safe area for them to be. There's sort of a trust and independence that that I notice between kids and their parents that I don't see very often here. Yeah. What I love about these types of photos too is it exemplifies a sense of fun and whimsy that, that, you know, just you start to embrace within a community and it's just like, yeah, I mean, this is, this is fun for adults as well as for kids. I mean, oh, that, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really, yeah, really I mean, what stuff. is a city supposed to be for? And you're, it makes you think like, what are we doing if we're not having fun on a regular basis? Like, why have we subjected ourselves to this um, life in which we can't enjoy ourselves a lot of the time? Yeah, this was in Hamburg. This just really amazing playground kind of out of the middle of nowhere here. I, I don't know. Yeah, it just seems like it's so cool that they prioritize this, this stuff. And um, it's something that could be super beneficial for, for so many people. Yeah, yeah. Well, and again, it's, it's that, that concept of creating spaces, welcoming public spaces that, that are trying to attract and bring in people and trying to uh, create stickiness, you know, really doing what we can to encourage people to occupy the space and be in the space. Yeah. Which it, unfortunately in our societies uh, too often, the exact opposite is happening. We're like doing things to try to discourage people from, from occupying space. Yeah. And then people are, are very worried about kind of a loneliness that's pervasive in our society. And especially during the pandemic, where people have been very isolated from each other, there's a lot of, yeah, isolation and loneliness and having public spaces where people can sit with each other and meet new people and, and just go outside instead of being kind of in their own homes, or I guess this is like a third place, like your Nathan Allabuck talks about, I mean, you were talking to him about this on, on the show. It's, yeah, it's a place where you don't have to spend money and you don't, it's not work, it's not your house and you can just hang out and it's like really, it's prioritized there in a way that's very, it's very cool. And I think it would really bring a lot of, of joy to people if we had more of this. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So... Are you fully recovered? <laughs> yes, I really am. It's all good now. They did a good job of, of helping me. Um, it was, yeah. And, 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 it, and it was, from, it was the but, left hand too, right? It wasn't your, yes, your writing so hand? Not, okay. not my writing hand. Yeah. yeah I'm yeah. totally fine now. It was ultimately a good experience. I was, I was kind of glad that it happened in the end. But everyone's very nice, very helpful. Yeah. 
Yeah, but I guess I, I want to add, like, as I, I we kind of talked about a little bit, I think it's important for people talking about European urbanism in the U.S. to make it accessible and not just kind of some vague inspiration of like, wouldn't this be so nice, but we can never get there. And I, I hope that what I've been talking about and what I've written about doesn't kind of exalt these places as being perfect because there are, there are problems there. There are people who are working really hard to make this happen. Um, lots of advocacy groups, especially in the places that are kind of up and coming, I guess, for biking like Paris and Barcelona and Brussels, there's like critical mass groups that they have there, similar style to in the U S and I just, yeah, it's important to kind of look at how this came to be in a way that, I don't know. It's, I think it's going to be difficult seeing how much pushback there is to just the idea of like the 15 minute city. It's so weird that people are so upset about that. I mean, it makes no sense. And so it it just shows that there is a difference here in our societies that we're going to have to combat. And yeah, I, I, I want to talk about it in a way that's helpful and makes it seem feasible for us to do here instead of completely unrealistic and this is what they do there but we could never have it over here yeah i think leaning into the fact that there's always going to be haters that speak up and they speak up loudly but i don't think that we we should confuse the resistance that takes place from the status quo of being that that's what the majority of people want necessarily. Oh yeah. And, and, and so when we see, like you mentioned the, the resistance to the 15 minute city, that was a bizarre sort of twist of a conspiracy theory that, that the 15 minute city is, is going to somehow mean that you won't be able to, to actually leave. It's like, it's so ridiculous and ludicrous that you're just like, okay, Got it. Well, I guess what I'm saying there is that we can't, if people really believe that, um, and they're, it's very sad if, if that is yeah. true. I don't know. It could just be some, uh, yeah, brief thing on the internet that's going to pass. But it's because they don't know. Like, it's, it's, that is totally understandable because we haven't really been, been shown a lot of the alternatives. So instead of listening to, yeah, a select group of people who are, who are, coming up with this ridiculous conspiracy theory, just build stuff that will make their lives better. And then over time, they'll experience it. We don't have to get the support of every single person. And I'm glad you said that. Build stuff that'll make lives better. And I can't think they'll of a better... They'll like it eventually. <laughs> yeah, I can't think of a better thing to, to, to highlight with saying that than this. Talk a little bit about this series of photos that you have uh, from this article, uh, because this is... This is actually relevant to building things that'll make lives better. And it also is something that Portland has, has, has recently done. They've built some pretty impressive bridges. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, this is a pedestrian bike bridge, although I didn't see anybody biking on it in Bilbao, Spain, which is a very interesting city as an urbanist case study and just a cool place in general. Um, they have the Guggenheim Museum Bilbao there. Um, and that was like kind of the main impetus for their urban renewal back in the 90s. It, so yeah, these bridges here, they're you know car-free bridges. They're very popular. There's a lot of walking in this city. Here in Portland, we do have, we have the Tillicum Crossing and we have the new Blumenauer Bridge, which opened this past summer. It was great to see the, both of those are, are car-free kind of pedestrian and bike bridges. And the opening of the Blumenauer Bridge was this huge, huge celebration. It was like everybody showed, it was so cool to like live in a city where people come out for this new bridge, bridge opening. And I was very proud of my city for that. Um, and I think people have, yeah, it's a beautiful bridge. People really appreciate having this kind of designated space to make their lives easier. And it, it's definitely, I definitely am very yeah happy with it. So I'm glad that we are following suit on things like that. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's a good point. And I think it is important to celebrate those successes and, and really draw attention to the fact that these really are critical pieces of infrastructure. And, uh, and when you do build a bridge over a barrier and, and, and really help open up, you know, the possibilities for many, many people, uh, it's something that needs to be acknowledged. Yeah. You still need to do those little things, right? (laughs) Getting some of those small details, right. Uh, and, and getting the maintenance, right. It's, it's like, you can't just always be focused on the ribbon cutting and the big things. There are those little things that have to also be done. Uh, but, uh, it, it is important to acknowledge, you know, building some of those those major major crossings and we see the same thing here in austin is that you know we've got you know a a river slash lake that we need to get to the other side to get to downtown and so having a bike and pedestrian bridge ours is the fluger bridge is is tremendous it's is very empowering for many many people and it's on all ages and abilities a piece of infrastructure so it's so incredibly important yeah and it shows that there's the the demand for it, I guess, and, and as well, I believe that, yeah, in the build it and they will come ethos as well. So when people see, wow, there's this huge party for this bike and pedestrian bridge, maybe we should check out what that's all about. And then, you know, they'll start biking elsewhere in the city. I do think one thing we have here in the U.S. and in North America in general, I think should really be celebrated is the advocacy community. And um, yeah, I think there's a really strong group of advocates throughout the country who are will stop at nothing to to make our cities better so yeah well i'm glad you mentioned that too uh you know another past guest on the on the podcast here was kathy tuttle who's uh very uh, very involved there locally and uh, i see that you also have a another article that you just wrote about you know shift and needing to you know Needs a little bit of help in spreading uh, the bike fun love uh, about uh, that. And of course, Shift is is one of the, the, the groups that very much involved with uh, the, the whole Pedal Palooza group. Why don't you say a few words about uh, about the organization and, and that event? Yeah, so Pedal Palooza is so awesome. I mean, this is in the summers in Portland. It used to just be every June um, for a couple weeks. And then I, over the years, it is extended. And throughout the pandemic, I think starting in 2020, they made it an all summer event because people weren't doing indoor things. So it was, yeah, throughout now, every summer, June, July, and August, there's pretty much, if you look on the shift calendar, there is a bike event, at least five events a day. People are doing, it's like 500 bike rides you can go on during the summer and this is happening so then but the shift calendar maintains itself throughout the year and they're distinct things pedal palooza and shift now shift is kind of the place you can go and and look or one of the places you can go and find out bike rides in portland which is a great city because there are always so many different rides going on and even in february when it's raining and it was snowing last night People are out biking and going on group rides and there's something you can do. So this is what I mean. Throughout the summer, people are, like who do not typically bike commute in Portland and, and wouldn't consider themselves members of the bike community, I guess, um, which, you know, I don't always like to use because I think it should be open to, to anybody. They start to realize, I mean, this is so much fun. Like I can ride through the streets with with thousands of other people. And it's an opportunity to rethink what the streets can be for. And I, I think hearing from some of my friends who did it for the first time this past summer and, and continued to bike afterwards and were really sad when the summer was over because they couldn't ride as much with big groups. I think it's very cool to see how this, something like this can shift someone's mindset. So yeah. having a really active advocacy group or multiple yeah group of advocates in in a city is very helpful for for doing this and for doing fun things it doesn't always have to be big protests it can really you could change people's minds i think a lot by doing having really fun unserious rides yeah well and and getting back to this this photo of of just normalizing riding a bike 
you know, it's, it's not an identity. It's not, I'm a, a bike advocate or I'm a cyclist or I'm a bike person. It's like, no, I'm, I'm just a normal person who rides a bike and I ride a bike to go have fun and I'm having fun while I'm riding a bike, but I'm not identifying that way. I'm just a normal person riding a bike. And that's where we ultimately need to get to in our society is just that, you know, riding a bike is just as, is natural as walking out the front door. Yes. I think that it makes sense that people have, they distinguish themselves as advocates because there's often a lot of pressure against them and, and things getting in the way from us just all kind of, you know, biking all the time where like they do in, in the Netherlands and in Copenhagen. Well, and to be clear, this is the result of fights that were had in, you know, 50 years ago in the early 1970s. Yeah. So, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So there were those advocacy organizations that, that fought hard and, you know, and the Fietzerbahn is still continuing to put pressure uh, on the Dutch government to continue making conditions even better, even as wonderful as they are, they still try to keep making it better and better and better. So, yeah, for sure. But I, yeah, it's just, I like hearing stories about people who, who use bikes because they're the most practical way of getting around. I mean, people, like, it's like, I, I guess I'd consider myself an advocate, they would say, but like, really, I, I ride my bike because it's fast, it's yeah. cheap, it's like, it's fun. I mean, it's not necessary. It doesn't have to be a huge part of your identity. It's, it's a practical means of transportation. Yeah. Yeah, I hear you. What, what final thoughts would you like to leave the audience with uh, either, you know, something you're working on currently or reflecting back on your trip? You know, uh, <laughs> I don't know, I guess um, working on currently. I mean, I'm always working on on something different and nothing huge comes to mind now. But I am always I think the reflection for my trip will continue as I see different things here in, in Portland and other places in the U.S. and realize, okay, in my mind, I compare it to something I saw that just kind of works a little bit better for whatever reason in the Netherlands or in, in Denmark. And that little reason, it makes it really work. And a lot of people bike in the city because of it. And so, yeah, over t- I just think the reflections will will keep coming. I think it's, it's hard to sum up something like this. And I also think that people should be able to experience great bike infrastructure and urban development without having to go on a big trip to Europe to, to see it. So I, um, well, I had a great time and I am really glad that I had the opportunity. I, I don't think everybody needs to go on a a big European tour. Um, I hope we can bring bring that to us a little bit more over here. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and that's part of my mission with the active towns channel is to try to produce content to hopefully bring a little bit of those experiences into, uh, into your screens and into your ears. If you're listening to the podcast, uh, and to be able to do that, to be able to experience that. What were you most surprised with? From your experience, what was the thing that that shocked you the most? I guess I was hmm, I was surprised by the fact that there was really no identification as being a cyclist the way that there is here, and it was both. I think that people might miss that element of it. It's possible if if it became so common of a thing to do that it was just, yeah, as natural as driving a car. I mean, as, as common in the U S as it is to drive. And, and I think that we would be able to reach a great balance if we could maintain some of that community that comes from advocacy um, and fighting against the status quo of, of car dependency and and actually getting more people to, to ride a bike and use active transportation. So I think that there's a middle ground to be, to be found here where we can maintain like these really fun events like Pedalpalooza and 
form groups around enjoying riding a bike. I don't have, think that all has to go away. But I think more importantly is that we create cities that are, are really enjoyable for people to live in and, you know, reduce carbon emissions by a lot quickly. And there are good and bad things to be learned from, from looking at places all over. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the, the things that I hear back from, because believe it or not, one of my largest audiences for my channel are uh, people tuning in from the Netherlands. And so one oh, of the things great. that they yeah. are most surprised with is how fascinated we are with things that, you know, so they're fascinated that we're fascinated with them. <laughs> and so, you know, it's just, and so I'm hearing back from them frequently that, and, and they, they actually say, thank you. They say, you know, you are, because we're tuning in and we're seeing, you know, through your eyes and experiencing this through your eyes and through your content that you're creating, we're realizing um, and appreciating much more the specialness of what we have. Because it, when you're a fish in water, you don't necessarily appreciate the water that surrounds you. And so that's one of the things that they've been talking about is that, yeah, I mean, we hadn't realized simply because, again, this is five decades in the, in, in the result of, of five decades of work. And so most of these people you know, may not even realize that this is kind of special with what they have there. Oh, yeah, for sure. No, that that was surprising to me, I guess, talking to people and realizing how normal it was to them just because it was so different to me. But yeah, I, I, I'm glad to hear that. I mean, that's, that's interesting. And, and I also know that there, yeah, as you said, there's still groups that are pushing their governments to, to do more. They're not done yet. And there's going to be things that they have to push back against in their cities too. So yeah, it's not totally perfect. And no. everyone is still working on, on things. Yeah, it's not totally perfect. There's always things that can be improved upon. And it's so essential to have uh, people such as yourself who are doing the work that you're doing, writing about this. Uh, thank you so very much for doing what you're doing and writing these articles. It, it, it's, it means so much to, to many of us that you're doing this. Oh, well, thank you. Well, it's great fun. I appreciate it. I was very honored that people were interested. I Before I went on this trip, I was I didn't know how interested people would be in, in what I had to say, but it was very nice to, to hear that people wanted to, to hear back from me. So I love doing it. It's great. I feel very lucky to be able to really nerd out about this stuff all the time. And I am fine reading 100 page PDFs about freight plants from time to time because I'm very interested in that, like, that kind of thing. Well, and we're incredibly lucky to have had you here on the Active Towns podcast. Thank you so very much. Thank you very much. It was great to talk to you. Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Taylor. And if you did, please remember, give it a thumbs up, <laughs> leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, it'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on that subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell as well. It helps you customize your notification preferences for all this new content coming your way. Uh, until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.